Good evening and welcome. Um, no, I am not Dean Chris McGann. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Don Blondin. I'm Associate Dean in the college. Um, Chris uh, has been looking forward to this evening for a long time. Um, she's got a packed schedule, as you can imagine, and this is the one thing she was looking forward to attending, but unfortunately she had a <clears throat> personal um, situation last night and is not, she's recovering well, but um, she's not able to join with us tonight. But she wanted to tell you how much she missed the opportunity to, to be here with you. Um, we're very glad that you could all be with us this evening, um, both he here in person, which is a great feeling to, to see actual live people, um, and also via the, the live stream. Uh, the State of the Sciences is the signature event of our college, uh, and this year features an exciting lecture that I'm sure you will enjoy. Uh, before we start, I'd like to recognize and give special thanks to the College of Sciences alumnus, Joe Bridger, for his continued generous support of the Spirit of Science Illumination Fund that makes this event possible. Joe is passionate about transdisciplinary initiatives and programs such as this one you are attending this evening. So thank you, Joe. If it's your first time joining us for this event, uh, I'll share a little bit of how it came to be. As you know, the College of Sciences was launched in 2013. Uh, our new college brought together NC State people and programs in physical, chemical, mathematical, statistical sciences, and marine earth and atmospheric sciences together with biological sciences. Uh, with the establishment of the new college, <coughs> we launched State of the Sciences, which has become an annual event where we celebrate scientific discovery. It's always been important to us to enhance collaborative opportunities for the students and the faculty. And this expansion of opportunities uh, is a key tenet of our new strategic plan that we launched just a few weeks ago. Uh, I want to read a, our new vision statement to you uh, because it speaks to this event. We are urgently expanding equity, public participation, and discovery in science so that anyone can contribute solutions to our world's greatest challenges for a sustainable, data-driven, and just future. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you can jump to our website now and, and see our, our strategic plan and our new culture charter as well. <clears throat> this event and our speaker tonight also exemplify the core values laid out in that plan, integrity, curiosity, collaboration, innovation, and justice. Through these values, we are moving forward toward advancing our four strategic priorities, deepen scientific foundations, enhance support infrastructure, advance equity and open up science. Um, oh, those are two, advance equity and open up science. <laughs> um, all right, <clears throat> um, so now I will introduce our speaker, Eric Dorfman. Eric is director and CEO of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and he's also an adjunct member in our college in the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences. As you know, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is an incredible place, an incredible resource for us and the state. It's the largest institution of its kind in the Southeast, and with over a million visitors a year, it's the state's most visited museum. Our college is fortunate to have a long-standing and fruitful partnership with the museum, thanks in no small part to Dan Solomon. Um, and Eric's leadership is taking this already outstanding institution to even greater heights. Uh, Eric previously served as director of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and Powder Mill Nature Reserve in Pittsburgh. Uh, before that, he spent 13 years in museum and conservation leadership positions in New Zealand. He's a member of the executive board of the International Council of Museums, an author of several popular books on New Zealand natural history and climate change, as well as scholarly papers on museum education, public programming, Egyptology, and the ecology of wetland birds. Uh, we're delighted to have such a distinguished speaker with us today, so please join me in welcoming Eric.
Hello, this is very exciting. It's wonderful to be here. This is the first public talk I've given in two years. It's incredible, I know. It's very, very exciting. And, and also uh, one of the first that I've given in the context of being associated with this university, which for me personally is very, very exciting. I'm so thrilled to be part of a scientific community that is just just rocking it. So it's, it's great to be here. Now, here is the talk, Can the Arts Save the Planet, The Coming Storm or a State of Fear? And this little guy here is to remind me to tell you that I am a water bird ecologist and I'm interested in global scale uh, changes in relation in, well, bird populations in relation to what humans are doing, right down in scale to the choices that individual birds make while they're foraging. So when I say science, I'm really talking about bird ecology. <laughs> <laughs> and with uh, some distinguished statisticians in the room um, and many other branches of science, I'm, I'm sure that you'll um, note my bias and forgive me. So let me just dive down into the subtitle here, that comes, do I do it here? Yes. From two New York Times best-selling books, The Coming Storm and State of Fear. Uh, and they are similar in the fact that they're books and, and that they are New York Times bestsellers and there they diverge. The one on the left uh, by Mark Albert, uh, looks at the future uh, planet consumed by climate change and the subsequent uh, chaos socially that happens. This one by Michael Crichton is really pseudoscience, likening the climate to concern, to, to the belief in witchcraft but we've got to remember that this is the same author that gave us Jurassic Park. So there is, um, you know, he perhaps is to be forgiven, but the, the point is that both of these books, hugely popular, consumed in large quantities, one is really based on robust science, one is based on hearsay and political leanings. So, that kind of sets the tone for what I'm going to talk about, which I think, I, I hope would not be a too uh, overstated to say it's an existential crisis in science. The way we, we do science and the way the public relates to it is not necessarily completely aligned. And what are we going to do about it? And that's the, the kind of the basis for what I'm talking about tonight. So climate change is only one of a whole lot of really serious environmental concerns that beset us and the planet. Here, I, again, I'm assuming, I'm going to assume a lot of knowledge, scientific knowledge, um, and mostly not explain it. Uh, but, but I'm very happy to in question time if there was anything that you didn't follow. Um, planetary boundaries, right? Nine of them, and already by 2015, we have well surpassed four of them. Climate change, loss of biosphere integrity, land system change, and altered biochemical cycles. Everybody in this room undoubtedly is aware of at least some component of these four, if not all of them, right? So this is very, very serious. And from my perspective as an ecologist, thinking about how this all wraps up, the concept that is really resonant to me is the Anthropocene. And this is something that it wraps it all up as a story that hopefully the public can understand and there is some level of connection to. So just uh, very quickly, I know that, again, I'm sure that you understand the Anthropocene. It's all based in stratigraphy. Here we go, this um, lovely cartoon showing all the way down 4.6 billion years ago, the Archean, 
all the way up to the top. You've got um, the Triassic Permian gigantic extinction and then the, um, the Cretaceous um, tertiary boundary here and the Anthropocene is right at the top. This guy's pointing to it and we don't really know how serious the, the sixth extinction is going to be, but all indications are that it's pretty, uh, it, it's going to be incredibly severe. And part of the reason why is it's happening so quickly. And so this is a, a, a really huge issue. Now, so I'm, I, the next three photographs are going to characterize three of the periods on here. We're going to start with the Pleistocene. Here it is. This is so lovely. You've got little patches of snow because the glacier's just been through. Um, it's, it's very lovely and bucolic. And then you've got the Holocene, right? So up, up until fairly recently, the Holocene was it. That's, we were still in the Holocene. And, it wasn't, and, and the proposal for the Anthropocene is likely to go through. And so, uh, but, but here it is. Again, still relatively bucolic, but, but you know, if you're a, a microorganism depending on a diverse habitat, you're not in good shape. Now here's the Anthropocene, right? So the, that is where the, the human activity has significantly altered the, the makeup of the, of, of the planet to the point where we are showing up in the geological record. And millions of years from now, there's going to be a band that is devoted to the activities that we're doing today, something that people can really relate to. But it's not just cows, right? We're, we're talking about the type of impact. Sorry, I'm kind of in the way here. Um, the type of impact uh, is, is pretty serious. Plastics are a fantastic uh, um, champion, not champion, but um, a fantastic um, example of, of what we're doing. It's also the scale. This is in Pakistan. Yes, this is all trash. This is a literal mountain of trash. And the extent of, of it, this is the world, the plastic in the world's oceans. You know, we talk about the great Pacific garbage patch, but actually look at this. This is everywhere. Um, and also the duration. So here, uh, this is... Africa at the beginning of the Holocene. Sorry, it's a little bit light here, so you can't see, but just so you get the idea, this is all green. It's all under forest. And here is at the beginning of the Anthropocene. And just to give you a, a little piece of data here, 7,000 years ago, right? So just when Egypt was getting going, Lake Chad, Lake Mega Chad, was the largest lake on Earth, 150,000 square miles. And today, Lake Chad is just 1,500 square kilometers, sorry, 150,000, 400,000 square kilometers, and now 1,500. So that, th it's palpable, it's real. This is what's happening to our planet. Yes, I am going to get to art in a little bit. Um, here is the front of desertification moving down into equatorial Africa. And in fact, this tiny little thing here, that's, that's what's left of Lake Chad. Globally, same thing. Human-induced desertification is everywhere, right? This is something that the scale of it, sitting here in this room, is kind of incomprehensible to us. But it, it's, it's um, everywhere. The marine environment, same thing. I just picked, could have picked the Great Barrier Reef, could have picked anywhere. But this is Carysford Reef in, oh, I can get back here now. Um, get a uh, Carysford Reef in Florida, 1975, totally fine. 2015, 14, totally gone. So that's, this again is the kind of global loss of environmental quality that we are experiencing but there's also people doing really good stuff, right? So here is the Nature Conservancy going out and 
plug planting coral. Hopefully it's going to take and get going and keep the reef reef going, although you do wonder about the systemic issues that are killing the coral in the first place. Sorry this is so gloomy, but this is really important stuff, right? Then meanwhile, there's other people doing amazing work on trying to save biodiversity, for instance, the African megafauna, right? So some really amazing stuff, and lest you think that the Anthropocene is simply a concept, actually here um, in 2016, they found the first, uh, in Norway, they actually did a study here, the first actual physical evidence that the Anthropocene layer is forming on our watch. So really important stuff. Um, and of course, it's all driven by human population. We know that this is not a, this is not a, a, a new concept. When I put this talk together, 7.9 billion people on Earth. And it's funny, a lot of the papers and stuff I was saying, oh, reading, they were saying, oh, there's 6 billion people on Earth, and we've so far passed that. And if you look, here's 7 million people, 8 million people, like it's just way up here. Um, and the latest thinking is that 1950 is the dawn of the Anthropocene, where humans really started making this tangible uh, impact on the planet. We are like yeast in a petri dish, right? If you look at the way humans have populated the planet over, the, over their entire existence, this is, this is it, right? This, the earth is our petri dish, and who's gonna come along and add more sugar is the question. So as a, as a scientist and as now an institutional leader, I think about this kind of thing, right? What are we going to tell the public? One million people come through our door every year and they're, they want to engage with us. They want to hear those stories. And this is a moment for science, I believe. So you do have some wonderful people doing some thinking around, and a lot of people actually doing thinking about how we solve these big scale long-term problems. So Drawdown, really an incredible piece of work and now has become a, a very important nonprofit. And by the way, for people, this is all available on the web, on their website, or you can download a, a a book from them. But all of these things, they're saying if we address all the stuff on this, on this circle, the sources, the sinks, and the societal issues, we can reverse climate change, which is a pretty bold statement, but they might actually be right. Then here's the IPCC. This is the latest one, 2022 it's come out. If you've got time to read it, it's only 3,600 pages. Um, 280 megabytes, um, but there's also the very nice 1% redacted version, 37 pages long, I, I, I would recommend that. But the interesting thing is, both of these versions in their introduction have this diagram, right? So they're looking, they're saying, let's get beyond the urgent stuff and get to the the societal forces that are making climate change happen. So this, and they're acknowledging that climate change is a human issue, not solely an environmental one, not solely one based in physics or climatology. That's really, really important. And again, resonates with what Drawdown is saying and also, actually, when you get to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, this is a very similar thing, right? A lot of these things which are going to address the same kinds of issues of the Anthropocene that I was just getting, you're just covering, they're, they're saying it's human societies and societal problems that will solve the physical ones. Now, that's what I think too, and I think that most of the people who work at the museum think that as well, and hopefully many of the people in this audience. But we've got a problem. 
right? And that problem is getting people's attention, right? There's, this is a, a very difficult thing to do when people are on the phone, on their iPads, everything 24 seven, they're not looking out the window. They're not walking through the woods. Many, many people are, I will say that. But we do have a challenge here with attention span, right? So back when I was getting into social media, it was all Facebook and, you know, people were writing, editing their entire life story on Facebook. And now it's TikTok. And, you know, it's funny because I thought I'm going to be ready for whatever social media. You know, I love Instagram. I love even I can cope with Snapchat, but TikTok can't deal with it. I cannot deal with it. And this is the thing. These sound bites are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. How do we get the complex problems of everything I've just been talking about, of the Anthropocene, of, of sustainable development goals on something that is the length of a TikTok message? Then we've got another problem, and that problem is shifting cognitive baseline. Basically, it's saying, am I in the way? No. Um, it's saying um, it was always this way. You know, so what? You know, you, you, I, didn't, I never saw a forest here. It was always a subdivision, right? This is the kind of thing that, that people forget what it used to be like, and once you've forgotten, then it's okay, right? There's plenty of social issues that are also uh, covered by this phenomenon, and, and we've got to somehow connect people to the deeper questions and get society to remember what it used to be so that the new normal is not okay. We've got another problem, and this is, these are all data from Pew Research Center. They range, uh, this, a lot of them are for 2020, but, but there's some others that are more recent. So this is public trust in science. And so here you go, 39% of people in America say they have a great deal of faith in um, scientists to do good for society. Only 39 percent. Since the 19, since 1973 to 2018, only 44 percent, and that's been very stable. You can see that actually faith in the military has gone up. Um, but and and interestingly, commensurate with that, faith in medicine has gone down. It's pretty interesting, but science has stayed the same. Um, but 44% is not that great to be proud of, really. And then December 2021 declined to 29%. Now, I'm at a university. I don't need to tell you that that is not a good grade. So we really need to be thinking about fostering trust in society and how does that, how can we do that? Um, and then just two more little bits of data, no three. Um, let's just carve it out politically. Generally, Democrats have more faith in science than Republicans. And um, college educated people have more, um, more faith in science than non-college educated people. But even when you get it in the most favorable category, it's only 54%. So that's just not great. So 46% of college-educated Democrats still don't have a great deal of faith in science. And that, to me, is, is, is disturbing. But weirdly, paradoxically, 70% of Americans think that have, being a world leader in science is really important and that government Spend, expenditure on science is usually well spent. So I can't figure that out, but um, that is where we're at. So I'm just going to bring it home a little bit and talk about North Carolina and the context that, um, that I'm in and my colleagues at the museum are in and how what, what else we need to be thinking about in this state. And we do, as you know, as does this institution, we have a statewide mandate, which can be challenging to reach people who are not kind of um, 
already thinking the way we do. So first of all, the population is patchy. Um, here's the, the orange is uh, densely populated, the green not densely populated. And um, so that gives already an urban-rural divide, which we need to think about. Also, perspectives on science are often partisan, and the um, the and this is just this is a map of how people voted in the last presidential elections, and um, you can see that there's clusters as well, and also ethnicity is clustered. This is white. African American, Hispanic, and Native Americans. Oops, I'm sorry. Look, let me, uh, here we go. Um, this, and, and so that also gives us a geopolitical um, challenge. We've got to be thinking about how we get these messages across and how we do it in this very mixed, complex, nuanced environment. And the final one, and I, you know, I um, mentioned uh, TikTok, in fact, he's uh, right down there. Um, public opinion is really swayed by a lot of people or, or organizations or platforms that don't necessarily have the best interest of the environment top of mind. So here's us trying to have a scientific investigation that might make an impact, and here's what everybody's paying attention to. I had to have Monsanto at the top of that. Look at that beautiful, organic-looking, uh, lovely, homespun sort of logo that they used to have. So our mission to illuminate the natural world and inspire its conservation, and so really quite, and we, we went through a strategic planning process about 18 months ago, and all the staff were involved on the decision of whether or not to, to retain this strategic mission, and, and we decided to, but thinking about it in a new way. So it really breaks down to to illuminate and inspire, right? And I, I could have a whole lecture on the left brain, right brain thinking of illumination, and inspiration, but I will just say that it boils down to two kinds of activities. One is the actual science that we do. We create new knowledge, just like the universities do, and in fact, celebrate the fact that many of our positions are joint with one of the, one of the universities locally, most of them with NC State. And then the other half of that is connecting people to nature, right? And this is part of what we're doing to build trust in science. But we really want to use that unique voice to answer some of these global questions that I've just been talking about. And that's really key, really key to this whole thing. We can't do it alone. And so that comes down to the kinds of questions that we, or kinds of answers, like what do we tell people? What is the picture the, that we're painting for people in the future, right? It could be either of these. So I grabbed this off of YouTube. This is the final scene of Planet of the Apes, 1968. Fantastic. There's Charlton Heston in a little huddle. This could be our future. Could be, could be. Really? Climate change? Sea level rise? Equally, or maybe not so equally, this could be also our future. A very, very expensive build on some coral atolls, all that is left. I didn't grab a picture from Waterworld, I, I thought, but you know, you, you know if, you, if you saw that movie, you can think about the, the similar shape anyway. Um, the, the Who's going to pay for this, right? And is this, is this kind of solution where everyone's got their lovely little spot? Not everyone. How are we as a society going to sustain the survival of the super rich when everybody else is who knows where? Or, and I, you know, in my sort of early hours of the morning where I wonder where it's all going to, here's a lovely Peter Bruegel 
Renaissance, Renaissance painting. Um, maybe we're all going to go back to some sort of blended Middle Age, Middle Ages, where there's very low, um, low, low use of technology. There's plenty of dyst, um, dystopic futures uh, in in media and in, in books that that paint something like this. And maybe it is, and maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Maybe that's what's sustainable. But when we try to pick this apart, and I'm still getting to art, um, we've got, like, I'm, I, this is such a complex question, and I don't know the answer to it. Here's a beautiful world where everybody's happy and all the animals are sustained and everything's lovely and there's no plastic. Here's one where it all just comes crashing down and it's completely gone. It is like the surface of Mars. Here, I've got three questions. Sea level rise, yes or no? Do we run out of oil, yes or no? Do we run out of water, yes or no? So just these three questions give eight potential answers. Right, so that's incredibly simplistic. How about when we look at a dendrogram of a whole lot more? Right, well, sorry, this is very light, but, um, uh, low, but running out of meat, loss of arable land, clean air, bees, food-related illness, COVID, carbon cycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You come up with this dendrogram that is impossibly complex. We can't pick that apart for ourselves as the scientific community, much less pick it apart for a member of the public. How do we make this real for somebody? Now, this is a wicked problem. Sorry, it is, again, very light. It says wicked problem up here. Multiple interacting factors that are only partially understood. There are lots of different solutions and different consequences, and some of them are negative. That's a wicked problem, and that's what we've got with what's going to happen with our future as a species and as a planet. And, of course, once again, all these things, which you saw, or hopefully you saw some of on that big list, right? We've got everything from child obesity to empowerment of women to urban wildlife. All these things wrap up and are somehow connected to the, the deep questions around the future of our planet. Wow, so that's, that's rough. That, there's a lot in that. And, and so this is where I think we need a plan. And so I'm gonna just jump right back into ancient history and think about plans of yore, right? So here we go, Augustus Caesar, first century AD, and then 700 years later, you've got Charlemagne, also emperor. Look at the quality of art, right? Just nothing else, just how beautiful that, uh, uh, that statue of Augustus with all of the majesty of the Roman Empire. And then you've got Charlemagne being crowned uh, in 801 AD as the Holy Roman Emperor. Such a vast gulf. In ancient Rome, there was, this is underfloor heating here is a multi-tool like a Swiss army knife. Here are, here's a midwife, right? So you have a very sophisticated career path for everyone in Roman society. Then you've got, you're gonna jump now to, this is Charlemagne's pulpit in his cathedral. And if you look here, these are Roman bulls that are blown they're from ancient Rome, and the reason why these were so precious as to go in this literally solid gold, oops, oops, what did I do? Here we go, come on. Gold-plated pulpit is because they didn't know how to blow glass. They couldn't make these. They couldn't read most of them either. But Charlemagne was no fool, and he knew the power of a grand gesture. And this is his cathedral, which is still there in Aachen. And um, I'm going to show you the inside of this dome. Incredibly impressive. And, and as were many of the, the, the cathedrals in this period. And in fact, one of the things that I wrote in one of the books that I, that I wrote in, in, on museology was that 
museums have the potential in the future of playing the role that, that cathedrals did in the Gothic era. When the rest of the world is losing knowledge and going chaotic, we are the institution not only that holds the knowledge but turns it inside out for the public to understand in some way. So here is, um, this is Dante being shown uh, paradise and um, here's the angels and of course the Virgin Mary here and this bit of it is the key point why this conversation goes and swings towards the arts because for people in the Gothic, in Gothic era Europe what was, why did they, why were they faithful? Why did they do, why were they so connected to the church? Life was terrible, right? They were dying of the plague, they were poor, there were rats everywhere, there was, it was, it was a really rough existence. But there was an emotional in, investment because this was something to care about. And these cathedrals, they were in a way an artistic expression that gave them something to care about. There was also a guideline for personal behavior. They were being told what to do. Come to church on Sunday, eat fish on Friday, genuflect, do the rosary. All of these things were day by day, minute by minute ways that you could be let into the kingdom of heaven. And that's the reward. However awful your life is, if you're faithful, if you're a good person, you will have everlasting life. Now, I'm not thinking the museum can offer everlasting life. I just want to be completely clear on that. But what this does do is say, is challenge us in my community, and I think all of us as scientists, to innovate and start saying, OK, in the Gothic era, the Catholic Church had a lot of mojo, right? How do we get? some of that, that investment in, in people, not just for saving the environment, but for valuing science and for trusting science when unfavorable governments come in and try to knock it or, or undermine it or underplay, right? Why are people saying, well, I don't need to get vaccinated for COVID. I don't care that a scientist or a medical scientist tells me that I need to. Somehow, what I saw on Google was better as a guide. We need to be the guide for people on scientific issues. So we've got to start having a message. And that's where, when I said, can the arts save the planet alone? I don't think so. You know, you think about Jeep ads. Jeeps, I, I was going to show some slides here, but I didn't know where to put them in. The Jeep, 11 miles to the gallon. And yet, every, tons of imagery with the environment, with, the, with, you know, save the planet, drive a Jeep. Well, how do you figure that? So what does this actually mean? And I will say, I don't know, right? I don't have the answers. I'm coming to you with the questions that I am thinking about in my daily life. There are some fantastic, clever, exciting imagery coming out of the environmental movement. So um, I, I, I love these. These are some of my favorites, but uh, there are many more. The, the thing is you never see gasoline being advertised in a clever way anymore because they don't have to. Right there, everyone's going to fill their tank up whether they advertise or not. So that's a really interesting phenomenon. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, every, I mean, gas all over the place competing with each other. Um, and here's one of my favorites, actually. And the thing that I love about this is that, so this is Greenpeace talking about ocean plastics. There is a lot of science behind this, right? Because schooling fish, the amount of plastic, how this is all interacting. Well, there's some science behind it anyway. And so now start thinking about the kinds of artwork that make you stop and think and go, wow, that's, 
that's incredible. That makes me want to do something about all this. So this has become an iconic photo. In fact, um, I've used it in an exhibition in a, in a previous role. Um, really, really um, one of the most iconic marine uh, plastic images that has ever been out. But interestingly, so this is 2016. 1983, something as prosaic as Mad Magazine um, actually had the same virtual image. And that's the point for me, is that all of this clever stuff, are we reversing the tide? Is that, is it enough? Is it enough just to show people the colorful imagery, or does there have to be a science-based call to action? The next, when I saw the, the next photo that I was about to show you, I, I was physically affected by it. So this is a mother lays on albatross feeding its baby plastic on Midway Island. It just, I, I look at this and, and it really makes me want to cry. It's such a powerful image. And um, this was taken by Chris Jordan in 2017 and he has a whole series of, uh, of images of dead baby um, albatross. And the amazing thing is that this, the birds, they're organic, they eventually decay and go away, and all you're left with is a little mound of plastic in the sand. And there are, the Midway Island, which is not very big, is just dotted with all of these little mounds of plastic. Incredible. Speaking of this, um, um, ben, Benjamin Von Wong, uh, another a photographer, he creates all of this and it's, it's real. He actually gets volunteers to collect the plastic bottles, take the labels off, clean them. There's a real model. It's all actually, and he shows you how he makes these. And part of his art is actually showing you how he makes, the, how he makes these phot photographs. Um, not just photographers. Uh, here's uh, Alexis Pauline Gums, who's a poet. And she has this wonderful book called uh, under, um, undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Pretty, pretty affecting, actually, when you, when you read the book. It's, it's confronting, but it's still, it's amazing stuff. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do at the museum is give a, um, give a platform to artists who are thinking about the environment. And so if you, if you want, so this is our podcast here. Um, and in fact, I, I see Adrian Smith over there. Hello. He's been a, he's been a guest. And in fact, um, I didn't have time, but I was going to put one of your videos in my, in my, uh, in my talk. Um, here's the, pod, the, the URL to our, I mean, I'm sorry, the QR code to our podcast if you want to hear it. But it is called, um, called Love Nature. So that's great. You know, having a platform for artists thinking about the environment is a fantastic thing to do. But is it enough, right? And this is where I think we need better integration between these outlets for emotional thinking and the science that sits behind it. Yes, there is some great science that goes into some of the artwork that I showed you, some of the writers, a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the different kinds of performers, but I think that we need more. And I, I don't know what that looks like, right? I, again, this is where I think more thinking needs to be, but I think that, that the science community and the art community need to start planning together. So I thought to myself, what would a framework look like if we were going to create one? Well, reaching back into Gothic era religiosity, there needs to be some reward, right? So what do we, well, and the problem is, yeah, a healthy planet, sure, except that it's so vague because it's such a huge scale. What do we even think about when, when we think about a healthy planet? I want my backyard to have deer and possum and raccoons in it. It's hard to imagine, well, maybe not deer, but cardinals. Um, so, <laughs> but, but the point is, that's the kind of reward. I need a personal reward, not just, 
survival the next thousand years. Personal behavior as well. So I mentioned that there was a guide, that a roadmap within the Catholic Church for the kinds of behavior that you should be doing. And you know, I was just reflecting uh, tonight at home as I was you know, getting this prepared. I, you know, I think that people should be growing, growing their own food, and we have plenty of room on our little plot of land for a couple of chickens and some vegetables. Do we do it? No. Is that because it's easier to go to Aldi and, and get it? Yes, it is. So is that the kind of personal behavior we're talking about? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that those good behaviors are hard to do. Recycling is easy to do, so we think it's enough. We can say to a waitress or a waiter, no straws, thanks. Oh, I've done my job for today. You know, that's, that's not enough. Emotional investment. That's where I think the arts really has a, an opportunity to, to un, unpack, unleash a lot of the science that we're saying needs to get done, that, that emotional area. But leadership and organization, that's probably the most difficult part of it because who's going to take ownership of this idea? Do we do it at the level of an institution? And of course, one of the reasons that I love being having my institution connected so much to the university is that that kind of partnership is possible. And in fact, we're exploring that all the time. In fact, I'm here, so that's great. And mechanisms for dis dissemination. Well, look, again, if it's TikTok, I'm out. Um, so what have we learned so far? You know, that in my context, what are the kinds of things that when I review what we can do or what we are doing, what, what are kind of our learnings? Well, thinking about making a difference consciously, not just getting up and doing what we do because we do it, but saying, how does everything I do on a daily basis matter for the difference that I want to make. And that's, that's not easy when you've got, like, you know, there's, a, there's not enough trash cans and the lights won't turn on and all those things that you've got to deal with when you're running a, a, a building like mine, that's all got to matter somehow. It's also got to be relevant, right? So knowing our audiences, providing the content that meets their needs, they're the, they're the heroes. We're, we're the people who are their guides, hopefully, but they're the heroes of their own story. Planned, well, we've got, I'm just talking about this right now. We don't really have, we have scientific measures. We don't really have any sort of other measures about public engagement in the kinds of concerns that I've been talking about. Connected, external partners, once again, here I am, and that's great. And then finally, We've got to keep ratcheting this on, right? This is what I'm hoping is for this to start a conversation. I don't have the answers. I would love to meet the person who does. And finally, I will leave you with one last slide, which is one of my favorite quotes. We must indeed all hang together, or assuredly, we will, shall all hang separately. Thank you very much. Yes, um, do I just, yes, please ask a question. But it has to start with, that was an amazing talk. <laughs> I, I want to commend you for your stimulating talk. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. You've articulated things I've been thinking about for years, and please take this show on the road. I hope you're doing that, right? Well, I did actually write it for tonight, so, um, well, but, go but for it. I will, well, I, I will do that. Uh, again, I have no solutions, no questions. And another comment is, many years ago, I used to give money to population control, and mm. that's when they planted about four billion people. Mm. And I remember these things they would send me, they said, uh, you know, it's going exponential. But the optimum number, they always said, was like 2 billion people. Right. And they said, uh, unfortunately, traumatically, we're going to go there someday. Uh, I don't know about that. But 
The third comment, uh, you think in today, for example, what's going on in Ukraine, hmm. you see authoritarian societies and supposedly liberal, democratic, maybe capitalistic, maybe chain letter societies uh, at odds. And then I think what I do as a physicist, uh, I, I do with a small quarks inside the proton. Right, wow. My colleagues yeah. on the gram, the universe, we try and unify that. Uh, how can we unify this planet when we have, uh, and I mean, COVID started to do that on the small in a way. It brought us together. Mm. Do we need aliens from outer space to come in on the grand to get us to pull together, to get our act and get on the same page? I, I don't know the answer to these questions, uh, but we're divided in the United States. We're clearly divided on the planet. Mm. Uh, part of this has to be addressed, uh, unfortunately, before we're able to get our enlightened self-interest on the things you're talking about. Well, and this is where, and thank you. Thank you very much. That's. Uh, a lot of really amazing insight and what there's in the middle there you talked about the the nano scale and the largest scale possible and that gets back to the 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 previous slide is that there we go this relevant bit and to me the the scale is really critical, right? So, you know, I don't understand quantum physics and I, I'm probably even worse with astrochemistry, but I understand everything on a scale of two meters by half a meter, right? That's, that's the scale that's relevant to me. And so how do you convert like a currency conversion the issues that you're dealing with to a scale that I can understand and matter to me enough to do something about it. And that's the, that's to me, so one part of it. And then the other part that I wanted to address was the end of your question with such a deeply divided world. And you know, I mean, we could look to, well, the Catholic Church uh, in the Middle Ages they didn't solve every problem. In fact, think of all the wars. Think of all the, not only wars that were done on behalf of the Catholic Church, but between warring nations within the Catholic Church was also very bloody and very, you know, not to be, not to be um, emulated. And that is one problem, right, that, that I, I believe that people need to care, and they all need to care about, they... You know, if you, if you give people a common goal, that's the most likely you will get for a good outcome. And the, the scary thing to me is that if we're down to the common goal is survival, we're too late, right? We've got to get ahead of this. And I don't really know how to do that yet, but it's what's on my mind. So thank you, that's, that's great. Others, hello. Hi, I have a question. Um, I want to address or ask a question around relevancy, around yeah. knowing your audiences and providing content that meets their needs and expectations. It was very interesting that the county where the most African Americans are mm. is Anson County. And I'm actually from Richmond County originally, okay. which is right. right next door. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And so my question is, how do you go about, or have you all looked at anything in terms of going about determining how do you bring this to audiences. I mean, the scientific mm -hmm. level, I mean, it's great. I get it. I understand everything that you presented. But I mean, bringing it down to someone in my community who, you know, they still burn trash, you know, oh. where I'm from, you know, right. in Richmond County, people still literally burn trash. So, so mm -hmm. how do you get this down to their level to, uh, to that level, I should say their level, to that level to make everybody understand that this is really important and really something that we have to look huge. at? Huge. That is absolutely huge. And of course, comes down to some of these systemic social problems that we need to deal with as an institution that has a mandate across the state, right? So we can't let that just, we can't turn a blind eye to it. So part of what we're, we're doing is outreach, right? So, and outreach comes in 
well, basically two forms. One of them is by uh, physically going out there, and of course COVID has made that difficult. Um, we are uh, giving or making resources available. In fact, we have Michael Lewis right here who is working on a, on a project that will be um, going around the state uh, which is uh, about race and about racial issues. Of course, and I haven't touched on that per se in this talk, but those social issues writ large are integrated really deeply with, with ideas about climate change, environmental justice. I mean, it's, it's, it's so deep. You know, I and mean, this could be a, a whole course on, on, on this. But, so that's part of it getting and meeting people where they are, part of it is physically going there, and part of it is making those resources available, right? We're, you know, just saying, yeah, we're in Raleigh, come see us sometime, not okay, right? Because, I mean, not only is the physical, but, but the, the, the emotional and psychological hurdle to get there. And so that's, that is part of it. And then the second part is working through local communities. And partly, so people who are already there, and that might be, so we, we um, are responsible for distributing funds to uh, uh, science museums across the state. And that's one of the, and that, so that's state government funds that we are passed through, but we also do a lot of stewardship with that program. And so, but also programs like the one that Michael's involved with isn't necessarily at a science museum. It could be at a church or a library. And that's, you know, and, and that, that also gets down to um, planned, right? We've got to say that this is important to us, not only in Raleigh, but right throughout the state and frankly, right throughout the region. We, we really need to be thinking about that and then roll it out in an organized way. So, but yeah, amazing question. Thank you. Thank you. It seems to me, and I, I understand some of the concerns behind this, but that a, a very obvious way to connect more extensively with the community, particularly with our younger members in the community, is through public education. Mm. However, <laughs> There are serious problems with that. As you know, so I've been involved with education for my well entire life, one way or another. Um, uh, but you know, I, I, I look back to when I was in fourth and fifth and sixth grades, and the kinds of, mm. of things that we did. The people who came in to talk to us, the experiments that we had in our classrooms and school gardens, and just all kinds of things where where we could do these things. And I know there are teachers out trying to do some of these things now, but when we start talking about climate change and the impact on human beings, politics has become such a huge problem. It's true. Uh, do you have any guidelines for where we go ah. with this? <laughs> you do ask all the hard questions. Um, I think we need guidelines, but, but the, you know, when I think about what got me into nature, one of them was my fifth grade math teacher who brought me out uh, so I was 10, ha stuffed a pair of binoculars in my hand and took me out and helped me identify my first woodpecker, right? That is, that has stayed with me this whole time. And it, um, having that emotional relationship can cut across political boundaries, can, can make, um, can, can help people make choices based on values. And that's a, a thing that I think we have to understand the power that we have when we connect to young people. Another thing, and it's funny, these are two bird related things. And so what happened to me? So when I was five, five or six, I was taken to the Science Museum in, I'm gonna say Los Angeles, and I saw uh, a chick hatch out of an egg, right, at eye level for a five-year-old. 
I, that is one of the most formative memories for me of, of any type ever when, from my early, early childhood. And so that's the kind of thing that I really want to do when we are thinking about what we have in the museum to say, let's give people life experiences. And that, um, it, 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 the, 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 the more we can get people out into nature physically, the better. And so one of the things that we do is, uh, it's called Educators of Excellence, this program that we have at the museum, which is teacher training, right? So they, but not just here's what you should do and, and here's some guidelines, but physically take them out, make them sleep in a sleeping bag overnight and hear the owls. You know, that's the kind of thing that, and, and you know, you get teachers who, are, who they've never been at night in the wilderness and are petrified, right? And this, but it's a life experience and they come back and they bring that enthusiasm to young people, which is, is the, to me, the only way to do it. You've got to know it and have it inside your heart to make an impact on someone else. So that's just my random thoughts, but yeah. No guidelines, though, <laughs> unfortunately. I just had a thought which I don't see much of in, in the discussion so far, some mention in the first question, and that is individual responsibility. When I was a student here in the 1950s and 60s and having dinner in the yard with other couples, one of the things that was important in conversations was a subject called ZPG. Right, right. And yeah. that has to do with individual responsibility and zero population growth. And right. that's one of the things that you notice very vividly in the charts you showed, but we're not talking about it as being an important factor. And I think it should be there as an important factor. My wife and I discussed it. We talked about it with friends over, you know, campfire kind of dinners. And I think that thought has been lost from today's youth. Mm. It is hard, of course, because um, you had the population bomb book in, was it 1965, I think, which made such a huge impact. I think the hard part is when you, you know, you, yes, it is, it is, it's such a complex issue about the personal choice of whether to have children or not, whether, how to structure families, and of course, see, the, the interesting thing, on a level, the, the people, you know, oh gosh, this gets into such a deep conversation, but you know, in, in the regions of the world where, or, or even the regions of the state, where we have um, uh, societies who don't need children to make their business tick over, right? You don't need them on the farm, you don't need whatever, you can be in your lovely suburban home and make that decision. Issues around things like climate change are about the distribution of wealth. In other areas of the region where you do have to have 12 children to manage the, the land base that is your survivorship and your livelihood, that's a very different kind of conversation. And, and so it's, a, it's, it's, it's nuanced because the question comes, and look, I have no children, and, and that is a, a, uh, an aspect of the reason why not. But the thing is, what we can't get into is wealthy, privileged societies asking societies who are just in survival mode or in free fall not to have children, however much we can see from the outside 
that would create more people, more resources for the people who are, who are still there. So it's a very complex, di difficult question, which um, I, I, again, it's, you know, these are amazing, amazing comments. And, and of course, we could be here all night on each one of them. And it's a, it's a big thing. And unfortunately, nobody has a roadmap or we would be there already. So, but thank you, great, great question as well. Eric, we just had one last question from an online viewer. Okay. Will the museums work within, will the museums within North Carolina work together to convey this information through K through 12 school field trips and potentially outreach programs in the schools? Wow, so um, if you mean the, the information that I'm talking about, that's going to be harder, right? I think because this, like, like trying to tell this stuff like this to a K through 12 kid has got to be packaged really differently. And I, I think we need to use these tools, not you know, so that that the outcomes of the kind of thinking that this is. We need to partner with the, if we are scientists, we need to partner with artists or say in the case of Dr. Smith over there, who is a, both an artist and, and a scientist. I think we have to have different ways of communicating. It's not just one thing. So no immediate plans to do this, but then again, I think it touches everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I just want to thank everyone for joining this evening. I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, and please go home and be safe.